critical theories in Western philosophy, which came into prominence in the 20th century. Advocates sought to achieve a socialist utopia by shaping culture. So in this video, I'll pinpoint some key players and ideas that moved beyond traditional Marxism into cultural Marxism and ushered in a multitude of contemporary critical social studies. The term cultural Marxism, not without its own controversy, was first employed, if not coined, in 1973 by Trent Schreier in chapter six of his book, The Critique of Domination. And many of the synonyms for this term that you'll hear bandied about when you on the internet, wherever you're at, uh, are like neo-Marxism, liberation Marxism, existential Marxism, and Western Marxism. Now, all of these terms have received their fair share of criticism, so it's important to point out what the term does not mean. So cultural Marxism is not synonymous with the Democratic Party. Cultural Marxism is not Black Lives Matter. Cultural Marxism is not progressive politics. Cultural Marxism is not liberation theology. Now, that's not to say this term doesn't have some crossover and there isn't connections that we could be aware of, but we have to be clear that it doesn't mean exactly those things. So here's what I think is a fair definition. Cultural Marxism or neo-Marxism is a 20th century iteration of Marxist philosophy that views Western systems and Christian doctrine as the underlying source of human oppression. So where did all this neo-Marxist or cultural Marxist philosophy come from? To get a better understanding, we can turn back the pages of time to look at the 17th century philosopher G.W. of Hegel. Now, Hegel's key idea was that society was in a constant state of evolution to a higher and better state. Now, the result of this, what he called a dialectic process, was to, quote, uh, create this new concept, but one higher and richer than the preceding. So then, for Hegel, we have to begin looking at the world around us as this closed system of culture that, that moves from this universal mind, uh, think like cultural consensus is what he's really saying, through this violent process of being nothing and becoming, or some people will put this Hegelian triad, this Hegelian dialectic as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Or as I show in this image, it's understanding to conflict to new understanding. And ultimately, this all serves to create this ultimate material, uh, new utopian reality. And in this chart, there's just a couple things to note. So this initial moment of understanding, Hegel said, really sublimates itself. It undermines itself to become conflict. In other words, the idea itself has its own built-in systems that will, will help corrupt it and move us to this higher levels of evolution. And it's important to note also that the transition from understanding to conflict was conceived by Hegel as a process of what he called Aufheben, that is to cancel and to preserve. So we get this idea of the culture cancels itself, yet it also preserves itself in, in some new and better way. And ultimately then this level of conflict leads to a new understanding, which is really the negation of what came before. So what this means is that concepts like truth and knowledge are really discovered. They don't exist as some absolute uh, understanding outside of the culture. They're discovered actually through the evolutionary process of cultural change. So now we turn to the page to somebody we're all familiar with, like Karl Marx, who was educated in Hegelian philosophy, but believed that the Hegelian dialectic must be turned upside down to be made right side up. So in other words, he thought Hegel had it kind of all backwards. For Marx, the revolution began with a dialectical materialism that is a focus on the state as the foundation for change. The abolition of capitalism, he believed, would lead to the eventual end of private property and the end of the family and the total reliance on the state. Now, the process of getting to this end goal was another thing entirely. So to overcome the oppression of the working class people, or what he called the bourgeois, required the terrorization of the privileged class or the proletariat. This may lead to, of course, new kinds of oppression, but eventually this dialectic process of revolution, he believed, would lead to a collective consciousness that embraced this communist utopia. It's important to note, however, that to succeed, the working class could not be shy, said Marx, about their goals, and they must embrace violence and even terror to overcome the oppression of the ruling class. 
The potential for evil and suffering was therefore really neither good nor bad. It wasn't a moral statement. It was just a reality. It was a process to get to the end. In other words, the ends would justify even the most violent of means. But for many, this Marxist approach was really too slow in bringing the change that was desired. So this led to what has really became a, a sort of a new Marxist or a neo-Marxist mentality. And Tony Grimshi was one of the first of a new movement beyond Marxist thinking. Now, Grimshi was fond of making analogies from war that he saw the state as really only a single ditch in the trench warfare of social change. And the state is really only a, a single line of protection for the real systems of power and injustice found in Western society. And just like Marx turned Hegel on his head, Grimshi really turned Marx back on his head and actually ended up back where Hegel started. So how then would this communist utopia be accomplished? Well, by an army of Marxist intellectuals embracing the, the, what he called the long march through the hegemony of the institutions who held all the power. Revolution required a gradual colonization, he would say, and a takeover of all the key institutions of civil society. As Grimshi wrote here, socialism then is precisely the religion that must kill Christianity, the religion that he believed was holding together this Western system of oppression. Now, Grimshi's banner was really picked up in the early 20th century with the Institute for Social Research, or what's really better known today as the Frankfurt School of Germany. The Frankfurt School moved beyond Marxism and, guided by thinkers like Grimshi, developed a new approach meant to usher in lasting social change. This new philosophy that they came up with became known as critical theory. This photo shows three really important figures in this movement, Jorgen Habermas, who's on the left, Max Horkheimer in the center, and Theodore Adorno, who is on the right. Now, like Hegel and Marx, Horkheimer believed that the seeds of revolution and self-destruction were already built in, they were baked into the capitalist system. Horkheimer embraced what is known as a new barbarism, which was a belief that violence did not have to be encouraged or discouraged because it was the natural end of the Western system and the ultimate path to the new utopian society. Now Adorno added to this mix a new anthropology which argued that authoritarian personalities were the root of corruption and caused by capitalism itself. Christianity conservatism, the patriarchal family, and sexual repression are all factors that he argued in this authoritarian personality. Notably, Adorno's pseudoscientific F scale claimed that authoritarian personalities were defined by anyone committed to a moral system or set of values that claim an external or universal authority over all people, especially, of course, Christianity. Then comes Habermas, who's really a second generation of the Frankfurt School, and he offered a new approach to justice through what he called discourse ethics. Ethics, he said, was not really about good or bad, so he's using the term in a very unique way, but one's ability to control their own political destiny and to seek their own personal fulfillment. So the goal of social justice then for Habermas is not defined by a standard of moral good or bad, but the ability of one to achieve their personal and political goals. Now we see this kind of exemplified in a lot of modern context, but this series of tweets gives one pretty good example. This woman admits that even a false claim of sexual harassment against men are justified because of the historic quote unquote oppression against women. So finally, I would like to make mention of Herbert Marcuse. For him, the concept of tolerance is useful, but has a limited value. So we're all used to hearing that ter term, right? Let's be tolerant. Let's have tolerance. We want to have tolerance. Well, that has a very specific meaning for critical theory. Tolerance, according to Marcuse, could not be tolerated in the societal level when it interferes with the end goal of social justice to free the oppressed. So therefore, speech that is deemed intolerant or speech that basically prohibits the cultural revolution must be suppressed and must be silenced. So in each of these movements and amongst these different thinkers, we can find hints of what is to come in our current age of critical social studies. Within cultural Marxism or neo-Marxism, the world is a 
a closed system. So any attempt by Christianity to impose an external truth such as God or morality or salvation or even a belief in the traditional family structure of a mother and father must be rejected as a form of oppression that will keep us from achieving the ultimate goal of communist utopia. So as we move beyond critical theory into our modern experience of critical social studies, here's just three items, uh, three elements that I think stick out as common values among these different philosophers. First, something to watch for is that everything changes or nothing changes. So all social institutions, family, the legal institutions, police, education, etc., are interconnected and therefore all must be fundamentally transformed. It can't just be one or two changes. All changes must take place for true societal transformation. The second theme that sticks out is that the ends always justify the means. So cancel culture, for example, is a justified because moral right and wrong, if there is such a thing, is really determined by the end goal of liberation from capitalist and Christian oppression. And the third theme I would point out is that cultural Marxism is social justice. In other words, justice is not defined, it's not about a moral good or a moral evil. Justice means anything that results in personal fulfillment and anything, including violence, which leads to the political self-determination of the oppressed. Now, I'm sure there's some more themes that we'll pull out in this series of videos, but for now... I hope this short introduction has helped you to see beyond the history of Marxism into the modern world of cultural social studies and motivated you to examine your own theology and politics. Check out my site at morethancake.org or my YouTube channel under the same name for more videos in this series.